since the initiative started, obviously a lot has changed with COVID and lockdown. Um, so the implications of what we were doing then have, have, have changed quite significantly. And we decided to bring together four of the participants in that um, event and in the publication to really answer two questions. Firstly, how would we do, dif uh, do things differently now if we were repeating the exercise? And secondly, what are the implications for producing digital pedagogical resources in and about the model languages or multilingual digital studies more generally? So we're not going to dwell on the tutorials themselves today. I'll, we'll put those in the chat for you. Uh, but we asked the presenters to provide reflections on the process they went through and challenges in creating open educational resources for multilingual teaching or model languages, uh, digitally mediated model languages um, in, te in teaching and research uh, based uh, topics. So today will consist of short, short presentations by four of the tutorial authors, followed by questions. So I'll introduce our four speakers and then they will in turn give a uh, short presentation. Uh, so firstly, let me introduce Donna Alexander. Dr. Donna Marie Alexander is an unaffiliated, an unaffiliated researcher and writer based in Ireland. She completed a PhD on Chicana poetics genre and style in Gloria Anfaldua and Alona de Cervantes in 2015. And before leaving institutional academia, she lectured in contemporary and 19th century American literature, Chicanics literature and culture, adaptation studies, research skills and methods, border studies, digital pedagogy and digital humanities. The next speaker will be Quinn Dombrowski, who's the Academic Techn Technology Specialist in the Division of Literatures, Cultures and Languages and in the Library at Stanford University. Quinn has a background in Slavic linguistics um, and since coming to Stanford, Quinn has supported numerous non-English DH projects, digital humanities projects, taught courses on non-English digital humanities. Uh, she's currently the co-VP of the Association for Computers and Humanities, along with Rupika Rissam, and she advocates for better support for digital humanities in languages other than English. The third speaker is Emanuela Patti from Royal Holloway in the UK. Emanuela Patti is a, a senior research fellow, a fellow in Italian digital media and comparative cultural studies. She's guest edited the special issues on experimental narratives from the novel to digital storytelling. Uh, and a special issue on reading practices and experimental narratives for the Journal of Romance Studies. A second monograph um, on, is on Italian electronic literature, uh, which is going to be published in autumn 2021. She's the forum co-editor of the journal Explorations in Media Ecology and the Digital Strategy Portfolio Holder of the Society for Italian Studies. And our fourth speaker is Jimena del Rio Riande, uh, and she's an associate research, researcher at the Instituto de Investigaciones Bibliográficas y Te Crítica Textual. Um, she's director of the Laboratorio de Humanidades Digitales, the Digital Humanities Laboratory. Um, Connie Set, she's one of the D Directory of Open Access Ambassadors for Latin America. Um, she coordinates the Global Classrooms Program for Digital Mo uh, Minimal Editions with Rafaela Villanti. And she's president of the association, uh, the Argentinian Association for Digi Digital Humanities, AAHD, in addition to being a member of order directors of Force 11, Text Encoding Initiative and the Pelagius Network. So with great pleasure, I will pass on then to our first speaker, um, Dono Alexander, thank you. Thank you. Um, just share my screen. and just minimize this. Okay. Um, so thanks again, uh, Naomi and Paul for inviting me to do this. Um, especially right now, I think we're all starved of uh, any social um, outlet of any kind. So even something like this is, uh, it's great to see other people's faces. Um, so, um, So the tutorial that I contributed to this collection is called um, Teaching Bilingual Literature in the Semantic Classroom, using Scalar to create bilingual collaborative literary resources. Um, if you're not familiar with Scalar, um, the developers define it as a free open source publishing platform that's de designed to make it easy for authors to write long form born digital scholarship online. It enables users to assemble media from different 
um, sources, juxtapose them with their own writing in different ways with minimal um, technical expertise required. It also gives authors tools to structure essay and book length works in ways that take advantage of the unique capabilities of digital writing. So um, that includes kind of non-linear formats. Um, the platform also supports collaborative authoring and reader commentary. So it ticks all the boxes for teachers who are looking for ways to develop um, research, critical and digital skills and collaboration among students using a digital tool. So for the purposes of this talk, I'll briefly discuss some of the pedagogical approaches and teaching experiences and experiments that uh, led to writing the tutorial. So when reflecting on, you know, why I wrote this tutorial and what I was thinking at the time, um, I repeatedly came back to um, three feminist writers, um, teachers and thinkers. So first of all, Margaret Randall, who's a um, hemispheric American writer and photographer, um, states that as we research our histories, we rediscover multiplicities. Frequently, these many layered discoveries are of self are contradictory. There is then the tendency to grasp a single thread at the expense of others in an effort to go deeper. Infrequently, there is exploration of a complex uncharted terrain and some new mapping happens. Um, I often share this quotation with students, usually at the very beginning of modules, um, to illustrate the research-based approach um, that I want to take with them and the feminist lens through which we'll be exploring uh, the literature in the syllabus. Um, and the single thread warning kind of functions both as an indicator of my desire to ensure inclusivity in both syllabi and in considering students as partners in learning and teaching. Um, so Randall's words then uh, remind me of uh, Adrian Rich's quest for feminist revision. Um, in an essay called When We Dead, Awaken Writing as Revision, Rich states that revision, the act of looking back, of seeing with fresh eyes, of entering an old text from a new direction is for women more than a chapter in cultural history. It's an act of survival. Uh, and this idea links with one of her most well-known poems, Diving Into the Wreck, in which she imagines feminist acts of recovering history, literature, and other sociocultural contributions by women and other groups who've been erased and sidelined in dominant narratives as an act of diving down into the depths of the ocean to explore a sunken shipwreck. Um, and these, um, again, are quotations that I often share with students, um, sometimes at the beginning of modules and sometimes when introducing assignments uh, or learning outcomes. Um, and this is really to copper fasten the ideas around feminist analysis, collaboration and openness that I aim for in class. And a cornerstone of my teaching goals has always been to provoke students to push their critical digital skills further, to experiment with the course content, to, to, to consider new connections and uncharted approaches, and to not see issues like lack of linguistic fluencies or other, other um, knowledge gaps as barriers to participation. Um, so my approach is then are further bolstered by the pedagogical work of Bell Hooks, who says the classroom with all its limitations remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality, even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. So I see digital spaces and tools and skills as extensions of that location of possibility. And especially in the current moment as online teaching and remote learning has become not just an experiment or an added extra, um, but a necessity. Um, the digital environment has so much potential to build enriching educational spaces beyond the limits of bricks and mortar campuses. So then Translanguaging pedagogies are particularly useful in this context because they ask us to move beyond the binaries of language and consider more inclusive practices to avoid marginalizing or privileging one language over the other and indeed one ability over another. 
and this is something that I first started thinking about after I did a poetry translation workshop with the late Cork based poet Matthew Sweeney and in this workshop participants were asked to translate a poem into English from a language that we had the least familiarity with and ideally one that we did not know at all. Um, and we had some language experts that we could consult with but aside from that we were just given a dictionary and sat in a room and told to, to figure it out. It was really interesting to see the final results, how creative and playful people became with translations uh, and how we started to use all kinds of different knowledges and, 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 and things like that to try to spot connections and, and, and get some meaning in the translation. So I began to think about how I could bring these ideas into my own teaching. Um, and then in an article on a pedagogy of translanguaging, Laura Hamon, Emmeline Beck and Aubrey Donaldson talk about a range of translanguaging strategies, including Beck's use of a collaborative translation exercise with a group of third grade students to, um, she quotes, um, she says, explicitly bridge students developing competencies in English and Spanish and to build upon their existing writing skills. Um, and while I don't teach um, translation, I did draw upon these um, collaborative approaches um, in an interdisciplinary module um, called US Latino Literature. And this module is coordinated by the Department of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies in UCC. And it was made available as an interdisciplinary module to students in the School of English in UCC a few years ago. Um, and up until recently, it was co-taught by my colleague, Professor Nula Finnegan of SPLAS, or, uh, which is uh, the short version of Spanish, Portuguese and Latin American Studies, and myself as the representative from the School of English. And working with students in the module over several years, experimenting with different methods of trying to unify students across programs and linguistic barriers, while also challenging my own linguistic and teaching abilities, uh, that all informed the, the tutorial that I wrote. Students taking this module via Spanish obviously have a language requirement that informs their learning outcomes uh, and their motivations and students um, engaging with the module as part of a BA in English are coming more well versed usually in, in literary criticism and that side of, of, of the, uh, the module um, and both sets of students encounter mutually unfamiliar languages and dialects like Spanglish, Tex-Mex and Nahuatl through the code switching that we see. In, um, in, in the literature on the syllabus. So I experimented with a lot of different methods to try to support collaboration, um, despite the different linguistic fluencies and degree mandated learning outcomes and other admin. So I completely exhausted the uh, learning management system, trying wikis and discussion boards and groups and all the usual resources. I tried using um, just simple blogs and getting the students to collaborate that way. Uh, I tried digital annotation tools like Hypothesis, uh, using hashtags for the module, to essays or Twitter essays, transcribe-a-thons, edit-a-thons and unexams. Um, and also in the more analog side of things, I, I did something that I maybe over ambitiously called Kerouacking the classroom. Um, and this um, was an approach inspired by the beat writer Jack Kerouac's scroll like um, manuscript of On the Road and the um, tradition of Talmudic annotation in which Jewish texts are kind of heavily annotated over and over. Um, creating this rich kind of networked information um, created by scholars and added to over time. So I created scrolls um, and you can see a photo of, of one there on, on the floor of my office when I was sticking all of, all of these together. So I created these of these long epic and documentary poems that were on the syllabus and then in the classroom rearranged it so that each scroll was laid out along rows of desks, split the students up into groups and invited them to annotate the poems with anything that they could bring uh, to help develop their knowledge and understanding of them. And there's uh, just a picture there in the, in, the, in the corner of some of those annotations. It was a very interesting exercise. And after playing with all of these methods, I decided I wanted something that could 
combine some of the most useful aspects of all these different approaches, um, ultimately while supporting collaboration um, among the students. And Scalar seemed to, to, to be the best fit. It gave students a kind of a digital sandbox, um, which is, was, I found very empowering for the students, asking them to work in public spaces where anyone can search for and view their work, gives them a sense of accountability and agency that a traditional exam format or um, assessment does not. And rather than relegating their learning to a filing cabinet or, or to a database of grades, their work is public, it's accessible, it's shareable. Um, it's usable. Um, and aside from the required minimum of engagement for the purposes of grading, I would open it up for students to, to work on the Scalar site or any of the other resources whenever they want. Um, and it gave them the opportunity to learn and develop without the pressures of making the grade or, or making a deadline. Students become partners in these contexts in teaching and learning and in these kinds of environments um, they not only use the resource to learn but they can contribute resources, thoughts and ideas to support their peers in their learning too. A platform like Scalar also gives them the flexibility and accessibility to learn, share and explore resources in ways that suit their learning styles and individual needs, offering students a seat at the table, not just as students divided up by their degree program requirements and linguistic backgrounds, but as researchers, as rediscoverers, as divers of wrecks, as freedom practitioners. Um, in this way, we can avoid uh, bell hooks worst case scenario, which is uh, when education becomes a demonstration and how students can best become clones of their peers. Um, and that's it for me. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um... So I think it's over to um, Quinn now. Hi, I'm Quinn Dombrowski um, from Stanford University, and yeah, I'm 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 also really grateful, uh, you know, to Naomi and, and Paul for organizing this, and um, really the whole team for for putting together this event, um, which now feels so very long ago, um, even though I guess it, it wasn't in reality. Um, yeah, I, I was I was the the um, enthusiastic problem child of this uh, tutorial writing sprint, where um, a, a, as soon as I saw um, kind of an opportunity to um, you know actually sit down and and produce something of value for um, you know doing digital humanities work in languages other than English, um, I, I I absolutely wanted in. Um, but the problem was I, I believe it was over or or close to um, the Fourth of July holiday in the U.S. Um, and you know, while I would be flying to to Europe, um, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, my my husband was not enthusiastic about me uh, being away in Europe even longer and leaving him at home, uh, you know, with a one, three, and five year old for for more time. Um, so I, I I begged to be involved, even though I wouldn't be able to actually like participate in a normal way. Um, and and Paul was extremely kind in accommodating my my strange time zones. I think I was I was up at like four a.m. at one time. We overlapped at like the edges of the day. Um, I was able to like zoom in to like what was otherwise a small group discussion. Um, you know, which which now I guess uh, feels pretty normal for everyone. Um, you know, but but back then, especially you know, kind of before before hybrid was part of everyone's vocabulary. Um, it, it was it was a strange it was a strange setup. Um, you know, but but I was um, it, it was a really wonderful experience, nonetheless, to have the opportunity to just like, you know, sit down and write a thing, um, you know, in a fairly short timeline um, and to get feedback on that, um, you know, turned around much faster than you would um, certainly in a journal and, um, you know, even more so than than, you know, other venues that have, you know, are, are well known for their quick turnaround, like programming historian um, to, to get that feedback immediately. Um, was was extremely useful um, and and actually I ended up fundamentally uh, changing what I was going to do. So I had these very big aspirational plans um, where I was not only going to explain um, a, a digital humanities method known as word vectors um, where you can essentially you feed it large chunks of text um, and then it's able to um, kind of 
infer from that kind of what the semantic relationships are between certain words. Um, so I was going to explain all of that, um, explain the math behind it, explain what you can do with it, um, and then um, you know demonstrate how you could um, you know prepare your text for doing this um, in a number of, of non-English languages. Um, and and I am um, eternally grateful to Adam Krimble uh, for his suggestion to scale it all the way back down to just that first part. Um, and, and as it's turned out, I, I think I think the the result of what I what I ended up writing about preparing non English texts for um, you know various computational uh, text analysis methods um, has ended up being far more useful than what I intended to write. Um, so for, for those of you who don't do, um, you know, digital humanities things or, or aren't familiar with computational text analysis, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of methods that have, um, you know, become fairly commonly used um, within, you know, some subsets of, of digital humanities where, you know, essentially we use, um, you know, various different kinds of computational methods um, to tell us things about the text, you know, even, even something like tracking word frequency over the course of a single narrative or looking at word frequency, um, you know, over centuries or, um, you know, looking at um, the degree to which, you know, one word occurs um, in close proximity to another word. You know, these allow us to track things um, in text that are difficult to do um, manually. Um, I mean, e even, even, uh, you know, for students who do close reading, um, it, it, it's it's difficult to keep, I mean, there, there are just not enough marker, highlighter colors to like keep track of all the things that you would want to keep track of, um, you know, conceivably. Um, and so this this is how, um, you know, I've, I've gotten to um, get some of my students um, in, in non-English literatures to like do some stealth DH, like, you know, there's there are those of us who like you know very loudly and 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 publicly like do DH, um, but there also might be a place for students um, of literature or you know of a language to like do DH quietly, like put your put your text into some of these tools um, and then be able to track things, but then go and and do the work manually now that you know that like you know there's one occurrence in chapter three and two occurrences in chapter five and you can find them and and sort of carry on with your close reading, um, you know, with just a little bit of computer help. But the problem here is, um, as, as you may imagine, depending on, on what languages you work in, um, you know, this is easy enough to do for English, um, you know, where we have very little inflection on our nouns and, and verbs and adjectives. Um, and it gets kind of much more complicated um, if you're working in an inflected language. Um, even romance languages have enough inflection to um, really trip up a lot of these algorithms um, where it just, it just doesn't work. Like, um, computers, like computers really don't know anything. Um, and, and when they're counting word frequencies, you know, for any, any number of these methods, what they're doing is they're literally looking for the same set of characters in between two spaces, um, which is mostly fine for English. Um, but if you have verb inflection or noun inflection, if conjugations, um, suddenly, even though like we as humans know that these are the same words, the computer doesn't know. Um, and so it, it can't actually track frequencies if the words are not like literally exactly the same characters um, in between spaces. And the spaces also can be a problem depending on what language you're working on, if you're working on Japanese or, or Chinese, for instance. Um, so the, the, the question is, I mean, on, on, on one hand, it kind of like, you know, aspirationally and, and idealistically, um, you know, we can, we can imagine tools that are kind of oriented towards these languages um, that have inflection. We can imagine what methods, you know, we could come up with from scratch um, if we were trying to, you know, do text analysis, um, taking Russian as the default instead of English. Um, but practically speaking, most of us don't have that amount of, of time or resources to build those kinds of tools. And so, you know, as, as frustrating as it is on some level, it makes more sense to adapt the language um, to work better for the tools rather than reimagining the tools, you know, from the ground up to, to accommodate the languages. Um, and so what this tutorial ended up being um, was basically like running through um, some of the issues that um, people run into when they try to apply um, kind of English oriented text analysis tools to other languages. Um, and and it, it would seem um, just in my experience talking to people that people who teach GH classes tend to not know these things if they're not like sort of steeped in modern languages more broadly. Um, you know, they, they, they teach using their English examples, which is fine. Having a common set of examples is, is like makes life a lot easier in the classroom. Um, but 
you know, for the subset of their students who are not working on English for their own work, um, suddenly the things they've learned in the classroom, like stop working once they go home and try to apply it to their own language, um, which is which is extremely frustrating. And, and I would add, you know, bad, bad pedagogy to to teach something that becomes, you know, functionally inapplicable for a set of students, um, you know, namely those working on other languages. Um, so, so this tutorial ends up being, you know, a like just raising awareness of the fact that like there are issues, like there are specific issues that you can address um, that go beyond. I mean, often, often people sort of like the, their the, their pedagogical takeaway from this is like tools don't work for other languages, like which is kind of true and kind of not because they can be made to work actually fairly easily with a few adjustments, but you need to know what the issues are and what steps to take to ameliorate those. Um, so the tutorial I ended up putting together um, sort of walked through those issues and um, you know, provided some suggestions for how to address some of them. So for instance, simple things like all text needs to be Unicode encoded. Um, a lot of older texts, particularly, um, you know, from, you know, old websites and things um, are in various legacy encodings that are specific to a language and not in Unicode, kind of the, the uh, you know, uh, global standard for encoding uh, text, um, which is what most of the algorithms are expecting. Um, you know, also things like lemmatization. So for a lot of languages, um, you know, what you need to do to be able to use these, these computational methods um, is to basically create a derivative text that is just like a nightmare from like a human readability point of view. Honestly, it's like your very worst language student like rewrote your text and like took every word and put it in the dictionary form, which is like, it's like, it's like nails on the chalkboard of my brain. Um, but that's, that is a form that is like, you know, computer readable in a way that the like kind of correct inflected form is not. Um, and so, you know, things, things like that. And, and, you know, coming out of that, I, I hope that there are opportunities to use this, um, you know, beyond simply the DH classroom. Um, I think there's a lot of, of interesting potential for, um, you know, taking some of these, you know, DH computational methods and, you know, applying them in, in language classrooms as well. Um, you know, like you can get your students talking about like, what's a word? Like, do we all agree on what, what a word is? Like, we think we know what a word is, but like with a computer, you have to be very precise about what a word is and you have to be very consistent. Um, you know, talking about things like stop words, um, you know, for some of these tools, um, it, like you basically get just like noise if you don't delete like the most common words. So, you know, articles, prepositions, um, pre yeah, um, thing, things like that. Um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, you're gonna get a word cloud with like Z and A and of, and you know, you're not gonna get at the content that you want. Um, so, you know, having students think through like what should be on a stop word list? What shouldn't be? Do you want to include numbers? Do you want to include all computer words? Words, because if you just search the internet for stop word lists um, in your language, odds are you're going to find some that were made for very specific purposes. So being thoughtful about um, the, uh, you know, the stop words list that you're using, um, you know, and, and, and thinking about kind of what your results are when you lemmatize a text versus when you don't. I mean, there's, there are a lot of potential applications um, that I, I think can, can make this a fruitful exchange going both ways of, you know, kind of making other languages better supported um, you know, in the DH classroom and, and making DH methods more accessible in the language classroom as well. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. So next is Emanuela Patti. Em Emanuela, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, all good, thank you. All right, okay, great, sorry. I think I, I muted myself by mistake. So thank you very much, Paul, Paul and Naomi for the invitation to, to this panel and also for the questions you asked us to reflect on, uh, which I think are very important for a number of reasons. First of all, Two years in, in our digital age is a long time, given the fast pace of technological development. In 2009, I agree with, uh, with Queen, it seems like a really distant time now, and distant enough for also for a quality assessment of the method and the, the learning outcomes that 
we were hoping for. And also uh, we were completely, um, well, we would never expect something like COVID-19. In the last two years, we have not only gone through a rapid technological transformation, but also, and even more significantly, uh, through a social and epistemological one when it comes to teaching and learning. So I'll, I'll address immediately your first question, try to be as concise as possible. And uh, whether what reflections are, do I have looking back about the process of creating the tutorial? Well, first of all, I think I should briefly just say what my tutorial was about. Uh, I was trying to explore how to make digital videos using software such as Adobe Spark video in order to facilitate various language skills through a combination of textual, video, and audio content. And my motivation for creating this tutorial was a combination of elements, uh, really. First of all, curiosity and excitement about new software apps and platforms, which allow the new and, access and accessible forms of expression and creativity. But also what I perceived as a need for both teachers and students to acquire a certain level of digital literacy and update our media of communication in class. And my point was that learning a language cannot be separated from learning how to communicate in the present. And communication today is predominantly uh, through digital media and within an ecology of digital convergence. And thus, when we learn a language, a foreign language, this implies learning how to communicate through a variety of digital formats, digital storytelling, social networking, and digital applications. But then there was another element which underpinned my motivation to create this tutorial, which was uh, the equally important need, I think, to develop a critical awareness about digital media and possibly enacting it precisely in the process of creating appropriate creative appropriation. The latest generations of students have been exposed to the internet, social networks, and mobile systems from an early age. And inevitably, this has produced a hypercognitive generation, which is very comfortable, uh, in fact, in using uh, these media, uh, cross-referencing them, integrating virtual and offline experiences. However, what is often lacking uh, is the awareness that every time we use certain technologies, whether it is devices or social media, we accept also a certain cultural logic embedded in it, along with its symbolic forms through which we communicate and make sense of the world. So in order to teach both old and new generations how to engage with digital technology and develop an awareness of how digital, digital tools are used to convey information and meaning, it's important not only to acquire digital literacy, but also a critical perspective on digitality. So it's with this in mind that I, I, I approached my, my idea to create, uh, um, well, to create a tutorial on, uh, on digital video, uh, on making digital videos. How did I envision and how do I still envision the tutorial being used? Well, my assumption was that the video is an excellent intermedium, in fact, as it combines text, whether it's print or digital contents, moving images, whether it is film footage, documentary material, and audio, whether it's music, voiceover sounds, and so on. So the process of creating video now facilitated also by this user-friendly software, such as Adobe Spark Video, could serve different purposes. And the most obvious ones in my tutorial were two. Um, first of all, developing language skills. And the second one was developing uh, digital literacy. So how can we develop language skills uh, when we create a digital video? Well, we need to engage with the various combinations of text, as we said, video or audio. Reading is practice, for example, when we research, collect, analyze written text, either print or web-based, about a certain topic, understand them correctly, learn the relevant vocabulary, formulate coherent new sentences and or text in the form of captions or script to read for the voiceover. Listening is activated when we select and or imitate dialogues or oral texts we want to reproduce and edit. For students, this could be the voiceover of a sample video produced by the teacher or an oral text. It could be a dialogue, description, a voiceover in a film or documentary. And then speaking is practiced when students uh, try to produce their voiceover for the video. So depending on their linguistic level, it could be self-introduction, it could be a series of instructions about how to cook a dish or a dialogue, an interview, the script of an essay, and so on. 
in this case, students need to check that their pronunciation is correct before publishing the videos. Uh, and either the teachers or web resources on phonetics can serve this purpose. And finally, writing is exercise when students have to come up with a script for the video, as well as the captions of the video frame. So at more advanced level, teachers can request a separate critical commentary in written form in which students provide an argument or explanation for their editing choices. And uh, so this is in terms of language skills, which I think is still, uh, it still provides quite a lot of material and purpose and scope for, for this uh, first uh, objective. But then uh, by doing that, uh, students and also teachers uh, uh, develop digital literacy. Uh, we can access and use our own pictures, videos, or the broad range of resources found on the internet, learn how to differentiate reliable sources from unreliable ones, ensure we select reusable material, uh, edit them using various applications and software, and gain also this multimodal literacy in the process. Video essays in particular are a popular educational genre, especially in screen studies, because they allow to users to transmediate between written text to a multimodal form of communication, which combines written, audio, and visual modes to communicate an idea or a thesis. And as an assignment, for instance, the video essay is an excellent way to develop an argument using the language of cinema, video, and visual culture. And it's also a way to reflect and critically explore how we think about what we see, uh, to quote Kevin Billy, um, and what he says in an, uh, in an essay film. So there are so many possibilities that can be used when we, uh, we uh, adopt uh, the video, a uh, digital video as, as a tool, as a new format of communication. Uh, it is it's something that can be used by uh, teachers um, and uh, students from five to eight years old, including key stages, GCSE, A-levels, but also can be used for undergraduate students from the first to final year and also postgraduates. I mean, the tool is though very flexible and it is the content that really makes the difference. So it is the sources that make the difference. In terms of challenges, I, I have to say, I haven't really faced any particular challenges uh, because what is needed in my tutorial is video making or editing software, database collection, a database or a collection of text and audiovisual material, including your own images, video clips, music files, sounds or material, or that you find, um, or material that you find on the web. So it's, it's really versatile also in terms of the use of material you can you can adopt. And then you need a file converter and a file management platform. Now I'm aware that these resources may not be equally available in every place of the world if connectivity is an issue. And uh, uh, but I also thought if we talk about digital methods, we assume educational venues with at least a computer or a smartphone and an internet connection, which is all basically you need to access the resources I listed. I was also aware that the video making software I used uh, would be subject to new versions and probably metamorphose into a new hybrid software in the future. However, the underpinning principle was learning the ability to edit different media materials in our uh, digital age and reflect on the process of meaning making through decoding and encoding. So technology will certainly change, but the method I think could resist time. And I think well, we can easily adapt the purpose of this tutorial using different softwares, platforms, and tools. What I would do differently uh, if I had to do this again? Well, from a technological perspective, I think I would probably review the softwares and platforms used and explore whether there are any better ones uh, that serve the purpose. But I don't think this would be my, my main concern. What I think, uh, I would do differently uh, is rethinking the purpose, uh, the purposes of digital methods in modern languages. I mean, developing linguistic skills and digital literacy through videos is still totally relevant. And I think with the widespread diffusion of e-learning uh, uh, during the pandemics, both students and staff feel now more comfortable when it comes to using and producing digital materials. So this is probably uh, maybe looking back. Uh, it's I, I haven't had the possibility to check uh, to what extent um, uh, the the abilities of uh, the skills, digital skills, 
uh, that students and uh, teachers share has improved during the uh, the pandemics. But I think uh, this definitely is probably can it can be much easier to do that now than it was it was two years ago. But if I had to do this again, I think my focus would rather be on, a diff on different questions. Uh, uh, for example, how to develop digital pedagogies that address issues of equality, diversity, inclusion at both linguistic and cultural level, or how to develop digital pedagogies that take into consideration digitality as a cultural logic and the impact it has on languages and cultures. So, I mean, as you can see, I think I'm moving because of my research interest. Uh, I'm moving my focus and my interest to from language teaching, although it's that the, the video can still imply a lot of, uh, um, uh, well, different approaches to cultural learning as well. But to I'm, I think I'm moving to a more cultural studies approach uh, and thinking how, um, how the digitality in our, pedagogies uh, in modern languages can be more, uh, in fact, diverse, encourage diversity, and also um, target uh, social issues that are embedded in the infrastructures and in the technologies themselves. So this is, uh, for me, uh, I think I'm, I'm done with my short presentation, and I think I probably also uh, started addressing also the, um, although briefly, the, the questions that you wanted to ask to, to the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emanuela. Uh, so over to Jimena del Rio Riande. Thank you, Paul. So I prepared a short presentation. Um, let me check, yes. And it's mostly about my experience writing this tutorial that was called Recogito in a Box from Annotation to Digital Edition. Um, a tutorial I wrote together with my colleague at the Pelagios Network, uh, Valeria Vitale. And so I brought some reflections and also challenges of writing a tutorial and writing in a language that is not mine, English. I speak Spanish. And about working with different uh, sources in this tutorial. So these are some of my reflections in this great work we, and as Quinn was saying, this happened, it, it looks like it happened so long ago. <laughs> so many things happened in between uh, King's College and, and now it's a different world. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say that uh, Recogito is a really great, um, tool to work with. It is an open source software in which we, you can do semantic annotation of texts and images. And something interesting about, interesting, sorry, about this tool is that it was created, built, um, thinking of uh, the classical period, thinking of the late antiquity and understanding the late antiquity as Greece, Rome, maybe uh, this kind of like China, etc., until the 15th century. And this was something that when I started working with the people of the Pelagios Network in 2014, I, I discussed with them because um, I was very much interested in using this tool that it's great and it is open um, to texts um, written in, in my region in Latin America. And I found that they were having a perspective of what uh, late antiquity was. And I decided that it was a good, um, let's say I, I could, what I could bring to the Pelagios network was thinking of a new chronotope for uh, them and adapting uh, the tool Recogito, that is a great tool to uh, work with to texts that had been written between the 16th century and the uh, 19th century in, our, in what was Argentina in those times that was called the Virreinato del Rio de la Plata. So that's how I started working. So you can see that um, the tool that I used for this tutorial was first adapted and somehow transculturated to my needs in the projects here in Argentina. And not only we were working with texts 
in Spanish, but as I said, with the different chronotopes, so, so we had to add different uh, geographic and historical dictionaries to the tools. And this maybe was something that wasn't at the beginning thought to be done at the Pelagios network, but that was finally done. So I think that we somehow decolonize also what um, thinking of um, other times in literature uh, was. And something interesting was that we all, we had uh, tutorials uh, written in Spanish uh, in the Pelagios network. This is one that you can, you know, uh, read when you enter Recogito and you're using Recogito, you will find that we have translated the basic tutorial, the 10 minute tutorial to different languages. However, the text that is used for uh, all of the translations is a very canonical one, like the Odyssey from Homer and a very like, like say classical one. So I was interested in, in, in showing in my tutorial all these things that we have doing because we had um, a, a multilingualism group in at the Pelagios network, but I was I, I thought that this idea of writing a tutorial uh, when Paul suggested was great to put into practice what we had been doing with this new chronotope, with this with this Latin American text from the 16th century on, and put all of this together. Not only multilingualism, but also let's say multiculturalism and more diversity. Uh, in the in the group, so that's why um, that was our basic idea when we wrote the uh, the tutorial from for Modern Language Open Journal, and what we did at the workshop two years ago at King's College. And one interesting thing about this is that uh, the text that I selected it's not also let's say a canonical uh, text in in Argentinian uh, literature studies. It's quite a forgotten text, so it was also a way, also of like bringing a text that could help being uh, annotated semantically and um, with a lot of uh, geographical annotations, but also bringing to light uh, it, a text that had been forgotten in in um, Argentinian literature studies. Um, I selected some questions that Naomi and and, and Paul. Uh, sent to us some weeks ago. And I think that one interesting one is how I would do things differently if I were writing this tutorial again. And um, Queen talked about scale. I would uh, talk, work on a shorter version if I were writing this uh, tutorial uh, again. Um, I, I think that uh, the tutorial is, uh, is it's now great and it has been used by uh, by many groups here and that's really good. Also um, publishing this in, in an open access journal like MLO was, uh, uh, was uh, great because many people um, read this and, and, and got to know the tutorial uh, in this way. But I think that I, I would choose writing a shorter version of the tutorial. And then I would like to reflect a little bit on, uh, on, on open education, res educational resources. That was something that uh, Naomi and Paul also mentioned in their questions. And I think that it's really very important. And it is, I think, part of the, of the context in, in which all this workshop and writing of the tutorial, um, the, it was our context. So, um, this is a piece of news that was uh, published um, last uh, last month in February by um, an, an initiative on open science that's called Dimensions, and uh, and it, it talks about how for the first time open access is surpassing it, surpassing uh, subscription publications globally, and I think this is really important to take into account if we're, we're thinking of openness and of working on um, open educational resources. Um, we should be all contributing to this uh, new open science era in, in this way. And this is a, a good moment to think about what we consider open. Uh, I, I think that not thinking of open educational resources is thinking of open access, is thinking of open science, but open has many uh, other definitions, working with uh, different languages, with different cultures, with different texts is also a way of opening and should be part of the definition of open. 
And also I think that in our case, thinking of technology as not only as open source uh, technologies that are really very important. And, and I think that um, they are really the game changers here, but also the question open for whom um, this year's uh, open access week um, highlighted this question. And it is not only working with open technologies, but thinking what kind of technologies our users have at home. It's not the same to be at home with three different computers, but or only sharing one with your <laughs> uh, family or just working with your cell phone or a tablet. So I think that in this sense, um, the, the COVID pandemic helped us to uh, think of open educational resources and openness. Um, also uh, working uh, with more, uh, more resources, sharing more, getting to know other people who were working in, in great uh, initiatives. Not only this one, I have selected this one, this one's because of the Capybara and because of the Italian uh, group that's working with the Oresto a Casa that is a great, uh, not only open, but also Libre um, software initiative that um, can bring um, new ways of working uh, in academia. So I think that in this, um, in this sense, uh, we can think uh, more about our tutorials in this context and how they can uh, collaborate. And as this last question for this last question, so as, um, as um, that uh, Paul and Naomi were asking, uh, this uh, workshop and this work on the tutorials made me reflect a lot on the really great value of writing tutorials nowadays, not only for digital humanities, but in academia. Um, this is happening with all the people that I have met, not only from digital humanities, but from humanities and social sciences. All of us are writing tutorials, are translating tutorials. So we should think about a new, you know, as we write articles or notes or uh, uh, in, in, in our academic life, I think that the tutorial has um, come now to stay as a kind of genre or a textual typology that uh, we should reflect more about this and also should be part of our evaluation as, as scholars in academia. So thanks, that's my part. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Naomi for the invitation. Thank you, Jimena. So if it's okay, I'd like to just start off by um, Firstly, adding something um, to the, those excellent presentations, really, really, really engaging, really thoughtful presentations. Um, I should have in the, my introduction uh, given thanks to the other tutorial uh, authors who um, really kind of uh, brought lots of different ideas to the, to, to the tutorial publication, the process. I should, have, I should also thank, um, mention Programming Historian. In the introduction to the, the, the tutorials, which Renato and Bernau and I wrote, we explicitly acknowledge the, the impact of Programming Historian, which for those of you who don't know, it was mentioned earlier on, but it's a very important kind of um, model for writing tutorials in the digital humanities. And that really influenced the way that we designed the, um, the event. Uh, I, would have, I should, should have thanked Joe Dale, Adam Crimble, Gabriel Salchot de Chivillian and Ju Lucy Jenkins, who also involved in uh, helping to coordinate and ask questions to facilitate the, the, the event. Um, and Liverpool, uh, Liverpool University Press, whose model languages, who were behind model languages open platform and who really were very, very open to kind of experimentation here. And that's really what's kind of um, going to lead me into my, my, my question here, which is, um, so the four of you have given a, a wonderful, um, wonderful exposition of, the, of, of what this was really all about, all about. We didn't want to just publish eight excellent tutorials, which I think you got, but we, we also wanted to kind of start a debate about what kind of um, what kind of resources are useful uh, at this moment in time? You talked. Donna started off by talking about experimentation, bridging competencies. Um, then Quinn talked about the integration of complex, really quite complex, complex computational methods um, for outside of the more traditional um, areas of linguistics and digital humanities, where they're used to to, uh, to, to, use, to cross disciplines to use them in, in modern languages. 
that we then moved on to Emanuela's um, evocation of the cultural embedding in, in digital interactions and new, new visual forms of essay and argumentation. And then Jimena ended up by talking about openness and the challenges in writing tutorial, which um, are really behind my question. And you, some of you already started to argue this, but my, my question really has two, two, two aspects. The first is, it, we, this was very experiment. This was very experimental, delib deliberately experimental. But looking forward to something that would be more sustainable, what would be the kind of formats? You, 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 you all represent very different. Your tutorials all represent very different types of format for a tutorial. What kind of formats do you think would be most useful for this this space, which kind of combines lots of different disciplines? Uh, what kind of formats would be would, uh, uh, most useful? And what does that? Wh how does that impact on on you as scholars, as researchers, educators? Um, in terms of credit, because one of the problems is that um, it's very easy in, in, in the scholarly world. We all we tend to rely on publication as our um, as kind of the, the economy of, of credit and validation uh, within the system. And the, the kind of scholarship of pedagogy tends to be very much overlooked. Maybe less so in some areas of modern languages, but uh, but even in digital humanities, that I, I would argue that the scholarship, the scholarship of research tends to be given priority over the scholarship of pedagogy. So. What would, you know, in terms of your own credit, uh, the, the credit you need as scholars or the credit that other people would need to, to produce these kind of things in future, uh, what format do you think it does the community need and what, uh, how does that connect to your own need as researchers, educators to get recognition for what you do and validation? Well, I'm happy to start. Feel free uh, to jump in anyway. And answer the question. I mean, I think the I think the format you found uh, in uh, as a, as a mix of um, academic article and tutorial or is something that works very well because I, I'm trying to compare it with uh, you know any other kind of pedagogical approaches to teaching. Uh, we le we've learned them through uh, well specialized journals, articles. Um, this is something then textbooks, of course. And, um, and then finally through th training. So I think the combination of, um, you know, something like uh, uh, a section of a journal like Model Languages Open, Digital, uh, digital um, Languages, uh, devoted to pedagogies, um, which is regularly updated. Uh, and then uh, something that maybe can come also in the form of training uh, within the departments of Model Languages, for those, you know, more specific training for the purposes of what they have to do. I think that the combination of training and knowledge production uh, would work. Uh, seems to me like uh, a really good format to continue uh, sharing uh, methods, methodologies uh, and knowledge as well. Oh, go ahead, Jimena. Oh no, uh, I thank you, Queen. Um, I I would like to add uh, something. Um, I'm thinking about the format as like like the the format that we use for um, sharing our our tutorials too. And as I was saying, I I I if I had to write this again, I would choose like writing less and showing more easily what are the steps that we want to um, reach with uh, with our tutorial. That's one thing. I also missed when I was writing the tutorial crediting others. And I don't know, I, I'm going to paste the link here in the chat um, with um, within the scholarly communication group here in Argentina, we have been like, adapting and translating a very interesting taxonomy that I think that should be more used in the digital humanities as we are always thinking about projects and tools that have been developed in project work. And sometimes we're not giving enough credit to the people who work in these projects. And this is called credit and it was developed, developed by the credit group in which you can credit all the people that had been working in a project with different roles so uh, one thing that I would surely put into practice if I was writing this again would be like to credit uh, in this way the people who had been like developing the tool, um, um, working before uh, me writing the tutorial with Valeria, uh, so I could include them in, in, in the tutorial in this way. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's there's a lot of like interesting and complex questions here. Um, you know, particularly around like you know credit and careers and and things like that. And um, you know, honestly, for I mean, it's it's something that I struggle with when it comes to advising grad students because you know writing a tutorial you know for the programming historian or in any of these other venues, um, you know, is likely to be a piece of work that is going to have you know a tremendous impact on a large number of people. Um, but if if their kind of set of career paths that they're kind of currently triangulating, um, you know, includes or primarily focuses on traditional, um, you know, literature, tenure, faculty, research, one jobs, um, you know, like, it's not going to count for anything, um, although it, it may end up having a lot of value, um, you know, as part of their, their backup plans, because of course, certainly these days, um, only pursuing faculty jobs is, is a really terrible idea. Um, I mean, I, I guess in my own position, um, I have a lot of freedom because, you know, as as university staff, like nothing I do really matters. Um, and so like, I, like I, I actually can't do anything with credit. Like it's nice and whatever, but like, um, you know, I, I think, I, and because of that, I, I, I sort of feel an obligation to do, um, you know, more experimental things and do more of these sort of like grunt work, you know, base level things that enable other people to like do the scholarship that they can get published in journals. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, particularly for some of the more computational stuff, um, there's a lot of interesting potential um, in, you know, Jupyter notebooks and, and these, these sort of new forms that like, you know, in a single, in a single file can juxtapose like the actual computation you did along with like a narrative prose and description. Um, and so again, because like credit doesn't matter or, or, you know, for me and my collaborators, we have our own project that we call the Data Sitters Club, um, where we are, we are publishing, you know, this research along with method, along with, we're even writing about our feelings as we go and like the challenges of collaboration and like the frustrations of dealing with childcare in the pandemic, like all in the same package as like research results um, in, in some small attempt to like maybe nudge the field towards normalizing this stuff a bit more. But um, I mean, it, it really, you know, the, the advice that you give people really has to take into account like their own career state and context and, and where they want to go with things. Um, yeah, I'm just going to jump in and say I'm, I'm uh, in a similar situation to Quinn in that I have total freedom over what I do now because um, I've left um, institutional academia. So where I publish and where I speak and what I do is very much up to me now. I'm not trying to, you know, hit any metrics or anything like that. But for people who are in it, I think it would be great if something like these tutorials, as um, Yimena suggested, that, you know, that this would become measurable, that, you know, whether it's a section of a journal, whether it's a whole new format of academic publishing dedicated to these types of endeavors I think would be great and not just in terms of digital literacies you know in any discipline there are all sorts of interesting things that people are doing in lecture theaters and in classrooms and in seminars that could be so useful in so many ways um, and I it always when I was still in academia it it always um, grated on me that pedagogy and pedagogical pursuits were never really considered as important um, as other other types of academic publication and academic pursuits and I think something like a new tutorial format would be amazing and so helpful to so many people um, so I think that's a really interesting thing um, to think about. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. I, I'll, I'm going to bring in a few. I've got lots of questions. There are so many interesting um, subjects raised in all the presentations, but I'm going to open it up to just, we've had a couple of audience questions, so we'll open it up. Um, just a reminder, do you also feel free in the audience to raise your hand, your virtual hand? I'll struggle to see you, so if you can raise your virtual hand if you would like to participate in the discussion live. But just a couple of questions. So the first one is from Saskia. It follows from what something Jimena said, but I think it it might be interesting for all the speakers to have to respond to. So Jimena began her talk referring to writing in a language which isn't mine. The idea of ownership of a language or not is an interesting one. 
Do you need to be a native speaker to have ownership? Can digital technologies increase ownership of a language or open the door to forms of belonging maybe associated with na native speakers? So um, I don't know if Jimena, you want to respond first. I can answer this from like my perspective. I, maybe mine, well, it, it's a, a translation of like una lengua que no es mía in Spanish. Uh, it's like the direct translation, the literal translation. Uh, but I think, well, language is, is, is identity. <laughs> so I feel identified with my language. So, in, so this is one thing, like we can say in general, when speaking about academia, you can have sometimes different languages to communicate knowledge, science. Uh, we're using English uh, to communicate uh, knowledge in, in this case. And this is happening in, for instance, in the global digital humanities in which we have reached to this kind of because it's not a lingua franca, we haven't decided by ourselves that we wanted to speak English, but we're using this kind of coiny. And it's fine because it helps you reach uh, people from other places. So I would say that it's a bridge to uh, speak with others, to get to know other projects, to work with others. Uh, but when it comes to writing and to academic writing for, um, for people who do not have, for instance, English as a native language, it's really sometimes very difficult. It's not, you know, that you don't have the same competencies when you are speaking that when you are working with academic writing. And this happened to us with our tutorial. We, Paul helped us a lot polishing uh, the tutorial because Valeria is also uh, from Italy, though she has uh, lived for a long time in, in the UK. But in our cases, we were um, working in our first version of the tutorial because we i forgot to mention that we work this uh, tutorial bilingually we also translated it to spanish uh so that was a challenge for us it was a real challenge uh so we had these two talent challenges writing a tutorial with a text from argentinian literature from a non-canonical argentinian uh text from the 17th century uh, adapted, uh, that had been uh, somehow adapted to work with this tool, but also writing it in, in English and, and, and working with, um, maybe we, we had to check also the, um, the, the, the language because explaining something in a tutorial is not the same as writing an article. So we had to look for the words for the infinitives or this kind of things that were important while while writing the, the text together. That's what I meant by, by the challenge of the language. Did anyone else have any kind of comments on that? Um, yeah, I think Quinn. Sure, yeah, so I'm, I'm in a weird position here where um, like in, in my division, I support um, uh, the, the, the division of literatures, cultures and languages, which has all of the languages, except for English, East Asian and classics for various complicated like historical reasons. Um, so all the time I'm dealing with languages that are like very much not my own at all. Um, I can mostly read the alphabets for most of them, um, but not not even always. And I think I think this is actually one of the things that um, you know, where, you know, where, where speakers, um, you know, of other languages who learn English as a way to kind of communicate with other people across the globe are used to, like, kind of are used to being able to, like, navigate that disconnect and, like, struggling through it. Um, for a lot of, like, monolingual Anglophone speakers, like, other languages are just things that, like, you know, they never necessarily have to encounter and try to avoid when they run into them. It sort of fades into, like, this noise in the background and, like, they don't really want to touch it and, like, don't really know what to do with it. Um, and so I think this is really one of the challenges to, to getting, um, you know, Anglophone DH teachers to engage with language seriously is like you have to put yourself in a position where like you don't know and you can't read the thing. Um, and, and in DH, like we're, we're used to the idea of like collaboration where like, you know, you have a technical collaborator and you can laugh and be like, oh, ha, 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 his code is all Greek to me. Um, you know, but like, no, actually, what if you're looking at an operating system that isn't Greek? Um, and having to like help people through, you know, where the settings menu is when you cannot read a single letter on the screen. 
Um, and, and, and yeah, I think, I think it's just pe people, people need to kind of get over it and get some familiarity with the idea of like, you know, collaboration, you know, can be not just on a technical axis, but can be on a linguistic axis and you can collaborate with your student and help them through, um, you know, being able to implement some of these text pre-processing things. Um, even if, you know, you have to be like, okay, on your screen, do you see anything that looks like options or settings or stuff like that? Um, and, and just working through that. And if Donna or Emanuela had any thoughts on that subject at all? Well, I had thought some years ago when I had to anyway change, not change, but adapt to another language to be, uh, you know, in a British academia. So the challenges are there. They were there uh, many years ago already. Uh, uh, it's I, I, now it's I mean that one of in mean, that position where I think I I'm probably more uh, finding more finding it easier to write in English than than in Italian when it comes to to academia academic papers just because I'm more familiar with the language and more familiar with uh, but it's um, it is a big question and uh, I think uh, it has to do a lot with. Uh, um, I mean, the, I was, I'm trying to, to see how to address the question that has been raised, but it's, I think the, the point is that we can, uh, we can allow more voices to be heard and we can allow more, uh, more languages to, to write on these topics as well. I mean, through digital technology, but that, it, they, they still it is it is it is difficult to deny i mean it's there there is still uh, of course a big predominance of english language when we when it comes to uh, to digital humanity so that's that's a big issue um yeah i was just uh, i was thinking about the example that i used actually um in the the scalar site that i that i made as uh, as an example for the um, for the tutorial and the 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 poem that I used is a, an epic poem called I am Joaquin, um, which was written during the Chicano civil rights movement and then the author translated it into Spanish and then a filmmaker created uh, a short film um, and that was shown uh, um, all across America um, uh, specifically for people who were illiterate and could not actually access the poem in, in any language. And, you know, that always was a really good conversation starter with the students as well about linguistics, about ownership and, and things like that around language. And I think, I, I hope, maybe I'm recklessly optimistic, but you know, I do think that digital technologies can give students a bit more confidence to play with language a bit more that it can take, you know, I've found anyway that when I started introducing these things, particularly in that module where I had students who were just studying English and students who were studying Spanish, that there was there was more openness to kind of play an experiment and look at what the other students were, were, were looking at and have conversations. Um, so I don't know about ownership, but I think it can certainly build interest uh, and, and playfulness around language. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I think Saskia said it's very, really appreciated the responses, the thought, thought responses there. I was, um, another question, which is slightly different. So, I mean, Quinn addressed the kind of DH people who are a bit reluctant to engage with language, but we've had a question on the other side. So, um, at what stage of language learning should students be exposed to DH methods? And so maybe we're talking more here about modern languages students who aren't doing a DH program and kind of what stage, um, how do students react to DH methods? Is it something you find they adopt in their undergraduate work or is it rather something to expect from postgraduate students? So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um. I could jump in there straight away and say the 
again, the module that I used as an example for this was not DH, was not affiliated with DH. Uh, and I loved uh, Quinn's uh, mention of stealth DH because that's essentially what I spent a lot of my time doing, uh, going in and, you know, students are kind of expecting just, you know, a lecture and whatever. And I'm telling them, no, nope, bring in your laptop, laptops or smartphones. If you don't have one, let me know, I'll bring a spare. And we're going to play on this website or we're going to run this through, um, you know, so, some kind of program to see, you know, what happens. Um, this, I think, is something you can do at any stage if it makes sense. If if you can see that there's some kind of value that the students are going to get out of it, uh, whether it's in terms of collaboration, research skills, and you know, if they develop some some digital literacies along the way, even if that's not part of the learning outcomes of the course, well, you know, I think that's even better again, you know. I just stuck in the chat a, uh, a link to a, a great recent article from DH Quarterly um, by M Melinda Crow and Sarah Kearns about DH in a French language classroom um, for some, some concrete examples of, of what one might do um, when it, it, there's still very much like a language acquisition focus with digital methods. I was going to add that for me, it's a, this is a difficult question because uh, in Argentina, we haven't started like courses for graduate students. Uh, we don't have a master's degree either. This is the first year we are starting a kind of master's degree. So what we have been working with are very, uh, let's say, a, a, a mixture of students that are sometimes very young, others that are researchers or uh, so we have always this kind of like multi-age people in the classroom uh, so and and that sometimes is it's interesting because we always make them work we try to make them work in groups and to mix the, all of them to have people from with different ages in the different groups so that's that's the experience that we have had uh, in Argentina with the eight and up to now I would like to add, I think, I think it also depends on what digital methods we are talking about. There is still a lot of confusion about um, a digital, what digital literacy is needed at different levels. And that's probably required a bit of a discussion. Uh, what do we mean when, I mean, what kind of digital literacy is, would be helpful uh, for students of modern languages at, at the first, on the first year or second year or uh, as a postgraduate or what digital literacy uh, is needed for students of modern languages uh, in school. So um, that's still really confusing and uh, not very reg regulated. So I think that, that that needs some discussion, uh, probably a curriculum or something that uh, can progress together with, uh, with language learning. Uh, because as we've seen to, or even today, we have we we presented so different tutorials and uh, different approaches to um, ped pedagog digital pedagogy. So uh, they can they can be used in so different contexts, basically, and different levels. So I think some discussion about uh, how to organize a curriculum on digital literacy, which runs parallel or together with um, modern languages is probably needed, yeah. Great, thanks. I think, it, as you say, Manuela, it's, it's a big question, isn't it? And it's one that we're all um, working through and that recent developments have also changed as a few of you addressed how receptive people might be to that and what opportunities there might be. Um, I think in terms of questions, as I say, if anyone would like to ask anything live, do raise your hand. I don't think we've got, someone did ask if by chance anyone knows about similar resources in Portuguese. I don't personally, but if anyone does have any ideas for kind of DH Portuguese resources, there's a request in the chat um, for that. Um, someone um, in response to Donna's um, tutorial, um, said how much they found working with poetry and getting um, students involved with poetry um, has been, um, has really encouraged quite reticent students to engage. So I don't think there was a question there, but there was a request to be in touch, Donna, if you're happy to be in touch with them. Um, 
but yeah I'm sorry I'm just monitoring I don't think there are any other I might I might ask a question I'll use my uh, moment while there's um silence because I did have lots of questions one thing I wanted was interesting Donna mentioned about when you do so I think it's a kind of question of assessment and often you know traditional university assessment wasn't was not public and I thought the public and accountable idea was quite interesting of, of undergraduate students producing a digital output that is not just for their teachers but that they're putting out into the world and I think that is quite common in DH that we produce was we might engage undergraduate students in producing things that aren't just for a module you know that's not the whole purpose they're actually producing something that goes out into the world and I wondered that can be both scary for a student because you do say accountable you know they're accountable for what they put out um, but also I imagine quite motivating because it's they're producing something and I just wondered if any of you had any further comments on that kind of assessing and producing something that's public do, do you find students respond well to that um yeah overall i i found that the response was really good from students now in the beginning some of them would absolutely hate me and i could see it in their faces that they just wanted me to burst into flames in front of them but when they would get into it and they would start seeing the value of you know, the fact that some random person on, on the internet has commented on their blog or, you know, that they, they look at their stats and they see, oh, someone in, uh, I don't know, New Zealand uh, read it yesterday, you know, and they start feeling like they're a part of something more than just this module in this particular um, place and time. Um, you know, I think that was very motivating for them. Um, like usually in the non-DH modules, it wasn't um, an overarching um, assessment that was entirely in public um, because, again, it was, as Quinn said, uh, stealth DH. So it was like little bits and pieces. But one thing I found um, almost always was that students often went above and beyond. So they would actually end up writing more and contributing more because they would get so kind of almost hooked on this idea that it was all in public and it wasn't just me looking at them and that they had something tangible that they could actually take away with them, you know, metaphorically after, you know, after the module was over and I was a distant memory that they still had a website or they had an article published and they had, you know, something legitimizing the fact that they did this at some point as well. Um, so overall, a very positive uh, response with some fear and some minor hatred of me, which eventually did kind of turn into liking me again, but, you know, goes with the territory. Yeah, I had a similar experience um, doing something like that with the, the non-English DH class that I taught where everyone was working on their own language and we were sort of figuring things out together as we went. Um, where, you know, I, I had them take a look at the, uh, you know, stop word list for their language in Voyant, which is a, a popular sort of graphics based, you know, text analysis tool um, and, and critique it and, um, you know, then suggest a better list. And, you know, I, I let them know that, you know, with, with their permission, I will actually like send this to the developers, um, you know, as, as a recommendation, um, because I mean, clearly, well, you know, while some of the lists are fairly well vetted, some others, you know, were, were clearly like, it was a list they found online and includes like completely inappropriate words to filter out like article or computer or things like that. Um, and, and the idea that like, you know, you could not just critique things. And then, you know, most of them were, were graduate students in literature, so they were pretty comfortable with the idea of critiquing things, but you could also like take steps to make things better and people will listen, um, was I think kind of kind of a shocking idea and, and an introduction to, um, you know, a, a kind of ethos that that is is common in, in some DH circles, but very much not so in, in literary ones. I have some experience with blogging uh, together with postgraduate students, and I think uh, there was like, also a really, um, a really positive experience for, for them and for, for us all. It was part of a, a research project, and some postgraduate students were also involved. And I think uh, uh, 
it, it was very helpful not only to learn how to write, for example, how to summarize your research or your project in a blog post, which is a different genre anyway. So there was, again, it was a writing, um, writing skills, a practice, writing, I mean, writing practice for them. But it was also, it has also, it, um, it had different implications. I mean, very, they, they had to learn things like, uh, well, first of all, so we were using the blog as a peer reviewed blog, uh, although it, sounds, it seems a bit uh, contradictory, but uh, uh, we were reading posts before publishing them, of course, and, uh, and then suggesting changes if needed and so on. So um, students found that really interesting and uh, and useful. And also uh, they learned how to, well, transform a piece of writing into something different, use images, checking that images had, uh, well, could, could be published and copyrights, following copyrights and so on. So, and then uh, um, also, um, being able to spread uh, to discuss it with with uh, with other per people from all over the world. So I think it's uh, it is an exercise that can work very well. Uh, can be an assessment. In that case, it wasn't, but it was part of a, of a project. But, but needs to be regulated as well. So it needs to be regulated by senior. Uh, I mean, if we if it's a something done by students needs to be uh, help needs the support of uh, of teachers and uh, and senior colleagues. So I think it can work, uh, and it's it's just it's really good practice for them. Great, thanks. That was um, really interesting. I've just mentioned that Jimena has unfortunately had to dash off so we are uh, we only have three panelists left but three excellent panelists so I shouldn't say only um, but I was just gonna I think that's most of our questions in this chat as I say do post any further questions but I think Paul maybe had another question that he wanted to ask yeah thank you well it was uh, partly um uh, I was reminded by something Emanuela said earlier on when she's talking about new visual forms of essay and visual forms of argument um but I'd be other presentations as well um, touched on the visual side. So one of the debates we had when we were putting this together was, you know, should they, should we be producing something where, which is fundamentally produced in textual format with maybe video and other other forms as a complement, or should it be primarily uh, visual and, and video focused? And I remember there's a quite a, an animated discussion between two of the advisors um, at the event. Um, and I don't think either of them were wrong. I think they were both right, but they were coming at it from different perspectives. So one of them was very close to Programming Historian, which is a, a text-based um, series of tutorials. Um, and I guess the text-based may go more naturally with kind of more, more computationally intensive uh, end of things. But the other person was coming more from a kind of language learning perspective and they were kind of arguing um, that, so I should finish off the first argument. So the and the text-based uh, person was saying the good thing about the text, uh, doing things in text-based format is it, you you get sustainability. It's much easier to maintain text-based resources long-term than to maintain video-based resources. And the video, per, uh, the person who's arguing for the vi video presentation was saying, well, um, you know, kids nowadays, people nowadays are more used to visual forms of um, learning. You know, learning through YouTube and so on. Uh, that kind of expresses the more multimodal aspect, multimedia aspect of, of today's education. So we should be thinking about video instead. What, uh, I mean, obviously it'll depend on the kind of video, uh, the kind of tutorial, the kind of learning involved, but what are your feelings about that dichotomy? Uh, Paula, are you talking about the tutorial or are you talking about potential practices for students or, or teachers? Uh, I guess both. I guess both the, the tutorial, but more more widely, the kind of the you know, the, the educational um, method, yeah, the kind of pedagogical environment. I mean, when it comes to tutorials, I think uh, the combination of the two is probably ideal because you can uh, you have both uh, both words and uh, and both advantages. Uh, so uh, I think as as, as, as you uh, instructed us to do, we, we had a text, we did explanation, something that is going to stay there, is going to be uh, recorded, is going to be end up in an archive probably in the future. But then uh, we also have the videos which are accessible. You can you know just follow them. They're quick to, to watch and so on. Um, in terms of in, when it comes to uh, 
present video presentations, for example, I mean, I think um, they are very similar. We, the argument will be very similar to what when we when we prepare a PowerPoint presentation or a, so it's something that you probably store there. It's um, I don't know whether there is any sustainability connected to that, any issue those that you it might uh, you know may generate from uh, from this exercise. But basically, yeah, there are two different things really. Um. Yeah, I think I think a mixture really is 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 key, um, and it's I didn't talk too much about universal design and and that kind of um, side of thinking um, in my tutorial, but that was one of the reasons why I I, I liked um, Scalar because it did uh, and it does allow for you know a mix of engagement. So you know a, a student who maybe doesn't feel very comfortable uh you know doing a video presentation could write a post um you know whereas you know a student who feels uh that they're much better communicators verbally than than writing stuff down can do it that way and it, you know it kind of opens things up in terms of accessibility and then i suppose i was just thinking about uh about my my own um situation then as well so like i i love audiobooks because I have ADHD, so I find it very hard <laughs> to read a, a whole book, even though I did a PhD in literature, but that's a whole other uh, other story. Um, but at the same time, if, when I take instructions to do something, I, I can't uh, really process verbal instructions. So I need something written down to tell me how to do something. So I think the more variety that you can have in these things, the better. Now, that's not always possible in terms of resources, in terms of funding, in terms of ability, but um, if it's possible to provide things in a variety of ways, I think that, you know, that's the, going to be the most beneficial for the most amount of people. Yeah, I'll, I'll just second all of that, um, perhaps even more emphatically to be where if I think if the if there were a requirement of a video output, I may not have signed up at all. Um, I. I am not like, like Donna, like I am not a video person. I like, I like, I need something written. I like the ability to sort of skim and pick things out and like scrubbing across a video um, is, is kind of my idea of hell. Um, so, I mean, like granted, like my tutorial in involved like the least amount of things where I think like video would make sense at all. It was really more of like a description of concepts and stuff where I, so like, I guess in like, yeah, yeah, variety and doing what makes the most sense for a given example and a given audience, I, I think is, is sounds like the right move forward here. Thank you. I don't, I can't see any more audience questions, but as I say, do feel free to post. Um, if there are any, I might, again, use my opportunity uh, just for one more question um, of about multilingualism. So um, I think you kind of, I, this is one of the constraints that I'm interested on digital tools and platforms is the crossing of language and translanguaging was mentioned. And I think it's addressed in your tutorial, Quinn and Emmanuel, I'm sure there are um, issues with the platforms you've used and one issue I find with a lot of digital tools and platforms is that you have to choose a language even if it's even if it provides support for, for languages other than English it still often forces you to work in one language and a lot of them struggle and a lot of computational tools there are computational tools that are being developed for multilingual language use, but sometimes they're not very good. Um, I, it is a bigger challenge. I was just wondering if you find this a constraint that there's not much, um, a lot of tools and platforms are constraining the ability to work across languages rather than in one specific language. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's hard. Um, like that, especially if you're trying to do multiple languages at once, like at least for kind of the better computationally supported languages, like we 
are, we're getting a lot better, honestly, like surprisingly fast at being able to work like serially monolingually. Um, but uh, working in two languages at once or comparing things across languages. Um, I mean, the, the way, like the hack that a lot of tools are using these days is basically to like, you know, a bridge via translation, you know, usually to or from English. So the reason that like, you know, a shocking number of like, you know, sentiment analysis tools like support a bunch of languages is literally because they ran the English sentiment dictionary through Google Translate and like all the issues involved in that involving again, like, in, like all of those things are there, but like they you know, say they support it because look, they, yeah. Um, I mean, th there's, there's also the fact that like, um, you know, uh, a lot of like, it's not, it's not, it's not apples to apples. I mean, a lot of the cases as, as we know, like there, there are things that you can look at in some languages where like, you just can't in English or not, not very easily. I mean, like, you know, Russian has like a wonderfully complex set of like name diminutives. Um, and like, you could like what, like Jonathan, John and Johnny maybe, but like mostly it doesn't really work. Um, or looking at like levels of politeness in Japanese, like it doesn't really work. Um, and so, I mean, I think, I think they like trying, trying to pick the right questions where you can chain together like serial monolingual things um, to get to some like rough comparability um, is, is currently the, the, the best we can do. And going beyond that, especially in like a generalizable sense, like where you could do like arbitrary language A and arbitrary language B is really, really, really hard and probably will continue to be. Um, but I think, I think there, there are spaces for, you know, being able to make more concrete progress if we are looking at like certain kinds of things in a specific language compared to something comparable in another language. I suppose I was just um, thinking as well that, you know, even where there are difficulties um, with languages, you know, there, there are teachable moments in that and there are learning moments. I think, Emmanuel, you mentioned this, you know, when you when you were talking about um, how you were kind of thinking, starting to think about issues around diversity and inclusion and things like that. So I think even even when things are, you know, where, where there's a shortfall, you know, there are still useful questions that we can ask and and debates that we can have um, about these things as well might inspire our students to go off and fix some of these issues for us. <laughs> Naomi, I'm trying to think how to answer your question, but I, uh, uh, for example, when it comes to the digital video, I was, uh, I was thinking of, you know, that the input you bring in is, is basically the language you want to use. So if you want to work, you can basically work with any language. Uh, so I don't know in, in the experience I have, I don't know whether there is, that's really an issue uh, for the platforms or um, softwares I've used. Um, because the input, the message, in fact, is, is, is what is going to be um, used for uh, uh, for to, pr to produce the text, in fact, to produce uh, the the final outcome. Um, but there are questions. I think in the, when I was thinking about uh, being more inclusive, uh, um, I'm I'm thinking more about uh, how to organize, for example, programs like mocks or. Uh, other sorts of, you know, collaborative uh, venues for learning, uh, which can, where you can really make the difference depending on the approach you use. So I'm not thinking really of the technology here. I'm thinking more of the approach when you use especially collaborative platforms. And that's like, incredibly important uh, because depending how, well, the, pla the collaborative platforms you use depending uh, of the tools you have available, depending of the criteria that you decide, the rules that you decide from the beginning, that can be more or less inclusive, more or less diverse. 
And I think that's where we can intervene in terms of multi multilingualism, multiculturalism. I can't think uh, in terms of technology, but that's that's the other area that where we can do things. Yeah, really interesting. And, and it is that mismatch, which I think is um, kind of connecting some of the discussions in, you know, language learning about multilingual language use and kind of um, how we might encourage people to move across languages and then working with the digital tools. But no, really, thanks very much for those very interesting reflections um, to all of the questions. And I think the comments have been a lot of very positive feedback, I think, um, both on the tutorials which people have either already used or are now going to use um, and general um, thanks for your talk.